Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Strike, and I'm here with Alex Beddoes. Hey. Hey, so this is our first bonus episode of the podcast. This is exciting. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a very unique opportunity to talk to Rafael. He's a hard guy to talk to. Like when you're um when you you're outside the circle, like just because he's such a busy guy, like just getting a chance to speak to him is very difficult. So like being able to sit down and talk, and he's an artist I've looked up to mm-hmm. for a long time. Like not many people are as versatile as him and good at all of them, which is uh a rare thing to find in the art community. Mm-hmm. It seemed like and um I was so I so that everybody knows, I wasn't able to record this episode, uh, but you were there with uh, Daniel Wade recording it, um, and I was listening to it last night, and it really sounded like um, you're quite a fan of our Assassin's Creed and and the work that's being done there at Ubisoft. Yeah, well, you know, you look at most franchises, and it, you know, people become masters of their like that little thematic they have. Um, you know, you take uh, something like God of War, which is a fantastic franchise. And it's like, it's one thing for the the past 10 years. And then you go to like Assassin's Creed. I mean, they've done Italian Renaissance, they've done uh, Pirates, they've done Red Indians, they've done Egyptian, and now they're on um, Valhalla, which is uh, Nordic Vikings. And you kind of go, no other franchise does this. Like, And there's no other franchise that affords artists that opportunity and creativity. So it's -hmm. it's very interesting just to get into because there's no studio on the planet you can speak to about this like no other studio mm-hmm. does this like the ubisoft type of assassin's creed so it's just a great opportunity yeah i really enjoyed the times when you guys were talking about uh the scouting trips and just all the research that that has to go into making the game and making sure that it it um it makes sense for the world that they're trying to build it's genuine and and, and it's cool and the, the, the importance of that kind of research also um as you mentioned with Raphael's background and experience of being an art director, like getting into the details of what that means, what his role is and how he's interacting with the team, how he makes decisions and um, the design by committee kind of, uh, (laughs) you guys have a a fun chat about that. Um, Also working on an established franchise like he has been and trying to always keep it new, fresh and unique. That's a a challenge that is special for him. Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, is I'm glad he got into a the scouting trips because it's like you speak to a lot of young artists and like oh trips this is great it's a holiday it's like no you're there to work and i think it's very useful for him to talk about what the work is you do on these trips so people listening in who know that these trips do happen it's like it's there's a very distinct reason you go on them and just to talk about the his interactions with his team and like you know making a game which is something we're not making art we're making games and it's a team effort and he said um game development as a democracy that is a a truth that a lot of people in the games industry need to hear it's a very important thing and a big element because you these old cliches you know character artists don't like environment artists environment artists don't like designers and it's like we all got to work together we've all got to we're all buying for the same team and we want to make a game so to hear someone like raf talk about it it was extremely insightful Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right so the art blast for the game was on Tuesday earlier this week. Um, we're getting this episode out as fast as we can. Um, if you want, you probably most of you have seen it, but if you want more information on that art blast, there's an article on ArtStation magazine that you can look up and that will give you a link that you can uh, view all the artwork. So yeah, that's it for this. Um, hope you enjoy the episode. Rafael, thank you so much for coming on, man. Hey, man. I uh, I need to ask one question like straight out of the gate. Um, so what you're you're an artist I've followed for a long time on R Station, one of the OG R Station guys. <laughs> um, what you, this one from from my own understanding, and this is so everyone at home understands your job title as a brand art director for Assassin's Creed. Can you just explain like what that means? Because that's a job title I've never come across, and I'm just curious to know more about it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, obviously. I've been around for, for a long time on, on this uh, franchise. So um, uh, I, I would say like at the beginning, I was really focusing on, you know, shipping a game and, you know, it was the case on AC1. And after that, I've been, you know, working for different kind of industry. I've been uh, leaving Ubisoft, working for film and, and, you know, I joined Radio Effects in uh, 2007. It was a great experience. And then I decided to come back to, to Ubisoft because uh, I, I was feeling like a, uh, I was missing the uh, creativity we have in games. I think we there's a lot of interesting challenge 
in the creating, you know, the building process of creating an open world game and also uh, characters. So I really wanted to come back, but uh, with the experience I had from the film industry and also in, uh, you know, uh, co- concept design, concept art, but also visual direction, um, I stepped in with a, with a more high level position. So I was uh, helping the other art directors on different uh, games, on different games in different franchise, like uh, uh, Syndicate, for instance, or AC3, uh, giving high-level direction for the lighting and also even for the conception. So I would say I was sharing my time uh, 20% on the franchise and the brand on the comics and different stuff like art books, but also different projects and also working 80% of, of my time on the game. So time is like 100% of my time on the game and 20% more <laughs> on something else. So yeah, what so on that on that point though? Just could you touch on the film thing a little bit more? Because I so I didn't know about the film side of things. What what is the creative challenges that like were posed in film and that like games offered? To, can you just dive into that a little bit more? Because I've it's a very interesting point which I've heard men like sort of murmured from other people, but I've never heard it in detail. So what you know what what were the creative challenges that games offered to film couldn't? Uh, yeah, I think there's there's a, a bridge really between games and film, and uh, we can say that you know uh, just because the job can be very similar when you when you do concept art, for instance. But uh, as soon as you get more technical into the technique of making movies and uh, making, like I was doing matte paintings, so digital environments for for the film, using the plates and uh, you know do the matching and making sure that everything looks really plausible and very well integrated and you you basically have a good piece of art in 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 a film it's it's not noticeable if you don't see it but sometime in a in a game it's different you want to see uh the you know the 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 all the world building aspects so it's it's a, i would say it's a, it's a more technical challenge you have in film and sometimes you know you would call the matte painting uh, uh the great matte painting as indivisible art so it's uh, not the same thing when you work on a game and when you do environment design for a game. I was feeling it was extremely interesting because you, you get to, to know and work with people who are like extremely senior, have a lot of experience. Some people had like 30, 40 years of experience in film, in game. You know, it's a pretty young industry. So I'm part of the old guys there, even if I'm 46. And in the film industry, you could work with art directors and, you know, production designer who are 60, 65. So it's a, it's a very different uh, kind of uh, learning process, I would say. I mean, you've chosen one hell of a franchise for ultimate creativity. I mean, you, Assassin's Creed, like it's a very unique, um, I guess, opportunity because you've go from all these different, vastly different worlds. You've known, you know, you're from Egyptian to pirates to, um, Italian, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff. Like what, as an art, like as an art director, like most interplay, we, we know like a lot of these are specialized. You have your, your niche that you're really into, whether that's sci-fi um, horror, even could you know, um, thematics, you know, modern day, uh, medieval, whatever it might be. Assassin's Creed, you don't get to do that. You, you are open to literally anything. You can jump from one minute we're in ancient Egypt to the next day we're um, in the Renaissance. It's like, it's a, a very unique challenge, right? Yeah, actually, I, I think it's the, the, the beauty of this brand is that you, you can still keep the spine of the franchise and, you know, it's still an AC game and you have the hooded figure, uh, you have some gameplay mechanics that can be shared between different games. But what I love about the franchise is that you can really explore different universe, different worlds, and a lot of different time periods. So that's why I, I'm, I've been attached to this franchise for a long time. Uh, I wouldn't say the same for a different kind of game when you, 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 you're a bit more like a stuck in the present days when you you get a very strong comparison between the real world and the game world uh, what i like about ac is that you if you open your door you go outside and what you see outside is not comparable with what you see in the game so if you want to ex- escape uh you want to leave something different in your living room uh, i think ac is you know along other you know games with the very strong fantasy or uh, you know sci-fi themes i think it's uh, it's it's great and as you were saying, you can explore a lot of different kind of settings. Uh, and for us, making a new AC game is a completely new challenge because from making uh, London in the 19th century uh, or, you know, in the early age of the, you know, uh, industry, and then making an open world game when you create half of England and, you know, one big chunk of Norway <laughs> is a totally different challenge because you have to think about like a more like rural aspect and 
bring to life different biomes, different landscapes. It's not just about cities and, and urbanism. It's really about creating a, a full open world with a lot of organic elements. So uh, it's, uh, it's very different from game to game. Backpedal a little bit. You finish up Odyssey and you have this blank canvas. You can shoot, you, you know, Assassin's Creed is, like you said, you, you can explore any biome at this point. You've done mm-hmm. so, you do so many different ones by this point. How, what, what, how does the team, how do you set, how does yourself, how do you come together to decide on the next one? I mean, you, before we get into Valhalla, how do you even get to that thematic, like from all the other ones you've done? Like, what does the spitboarding process look like? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question, uh, actually. Uh, so we, we usually have a, a list of different settings we want to bring to life. And we also do uh, focus group, focus test, because we want also to hear uh, also the voice of the fans. So the fans have, you know, ideas of what they would like to see and what they would expect in the franchise. We do, you know, these kind of evaluations. And also as a team, we have to be, uh, you know, interested and motivated to work on a new setting. So it's a balance between what people would like to see and what we as a team want to, to bring to life. And um, as you know, we had a, a lot of different games, um, you know, happening next to the Mediterranean setting. So yeah, we had Odyssey, we had uh, Italy, we had uh, Origins, and we wanted to have something very fresh and different. So that's why we went to the Scandinavian landscapes and eventually the Viking fantasy. Also, you, you need to know we we are very attached to the fantasy. We we did the, we brought to life the the, the pirate setting uh, with the Edward Kenway in AC4. Um, that was a very strong fantasy and. and also, the Viking fantasy was one of the, the most important to bring to life. So, yeah, we were like super excited to uh, to come to this one. How strange was it to have that big shift in aesthetic? Um, I know with the the Pyron is kind of close to this, but you've you know like Odyssey, ancient Egypt is grand, it's um, it's eccentric, and now with you're in Scandinavian Vikings, it's very it's really really grand, and even in the trailers you can see just how grounded and gritty this world is yeah now as artists and as a as creatives how difficult is it to shift that whole mindset because you go from something like odyssey which like i said is very over the top it's dramatic it's big it's bold Mm -hmm. to this very gritty grounded aggressive feeling terrain and world like how does the artist how does the team shift into that uh, I think um, uh, as a team, uh, it's also very interesting to 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 make f- something very different and have this kind of uh, clash of uh, you know creative process. Um, you don't want to uh, to 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 uh, do over and over the same things. You know, even like visually, it's not the same challenge. So I think as creative people, we like this kind of challenge. We like to to go in a in a very different direction from one game to another game. Um, even if we have some gameplay mechanics that we can, we can see, we can recognize in the visual direction. It's, it's, um, very important, I think, for the team, for the, the concept artist, but also for the, the, the level artist and the character designer to be able to bring something fresh. You want to keep these people motivated, interested in working on the franchise. And I think the best way is really to, to have new challenges and like a, a new fresh direction. And, um, also, um, for the, um, the visual direction of, um, of uh, AC Valhalla, we wanted to, to move away from the cliche of uh, how we usually see the Vikings. You know, we usually see the Vikings and the, the rain, the fog, it's always muddy, desaturated. Um, that was also the case when you see historical movies, you know, TV series. They, they, they tend to have this kind of uh, treatment that is very gritty and, and very uh, uh, gray. And we wanted to... Uh, to, to move away from that cliche and, and bring a nice contrast between the violent, the, 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 you know, the violent era, but also the beauty of the world. So you have, you know, all these magical moments in the time of day, uh, the light flickering b- behind the trees, uh, a red sunset in Norway with the, the shimmering lights on, on the snow. And, and you will have some very violent action happening at the same time. So the contrast between the beauty of the world, this kind of romantic approach we had also in the visual direction and the super violent era is something that is interesting we wanted to to bring in this game so just to play devil's advocate um you mentioned it's good to uh, always give fresh new ideas to keep people engaged with the next new cool idea yeah as creators you know how it goes sometimes you feel like there is more to tell with a world like there's such big um 
they're such big worlds and the themes that you're covering are so large. Mm-hmm. Is there ever for you as a creative to fit the idea of, you know, okay, we're moving on to the next project. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much other stuff we could explore with the, these thematics. Like how do you wrestle with that? Uh, you, you mean how, how do we manage to, um, to, uh, to deal with the, um, the, the difference of the world, like the sight of the world? Just um, to- like how do you, how do you, you know, you're always moving on to the next big IP, yeah. I, you know, next big theme. Do you never think, for example, let's take Odyssey. Mm-hmm. Egypt's a very rich culture with a lot of different time periods. Yeah. Do you ever feel like, okay, we finished Odyssey, but there's more to tell here. There's more world building and more we can explore with this theme before we move on. Like, did, did you ever encounter that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's it's always the, the case when... Uh, when you tackle one fantasy, and I would say, like even the pirates and 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 uh, and origins, we yeah, we could have spent more, even more time on 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 this kind of setting. Uh, but uh, making a new game is is always a question of, as you were saying and recording, we we need to have these people engaged, and um, we do some DLCs, we have extensions, so we try to you know to explore as much as we can the fantasy of the world, but also the era and, and the characters. But there's also a need to, uh, to to bring something new to the table and something fresh. Uh, so this is where you step in with the new big AAA game and we extend the fantasy through the DLCs and the extended experience. So that's the idea, I think, at Ubisoft is, all, is also to to give more life to the world. And you, you've been seeing maybe the, the trailer for the extended experience on, on Valhalla. We, we have really more experience uh, to bring to the player through the actual game world we 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 created for Valhalla, but also through new DLC that would explore the Viking fantasy. So that's yeah, more and more the intention to uh, to be done at Ubisoft. That makes sense. I um actually I've got something. This I I speak to a lot of I spend a lot of time speaking to you know young artists, people, students looking to get in the industry, and they always talk about the trips. They always go, oh you know when I get into this AAA studio, we go on these trips, and I'm. Always, you know, stuff that I kind of always preface it with is understand these are not holidays. They're not just, you know, you're not just going to have a, a jolly good time. Like you, you go there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be quite useful, especially for someone like a, a, at your level, to really explain the benefits of why you go on these trips. And they are not just morale boosting trips for your team. You go there for very distinct artistic reasons. And I think diving into why teams go on these expeditions to these play, these venues be really useful yeah yeah for sure when when we go on a on a scouting trip for 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 a game it's really to to get immersed in the fantasy and um uh, really feel like really in touch with the, the 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 variety the beauty of the landscape but also with the culture of the people living there um if you want to bring to life uh constantinople in, in the 15th century you need to go to Istanbul. You need to to be in the you know in the markets. You need you need to go in the mosque. You need to see to feel the scale, uh, smell how how it is there, and also see the people acting. If you want to bring to life something that is authentic and also not a cliche of the culture, you, you need to to know exactly what it is. So that's why we we pay a lot of attention to these kind of scouting trips. And we went to uh, for Valhalla. We went to Norway and England. And at the beginning, we had some plans to to visit uh, cities and museums, and I, and I and I told to the to the people organizing the trip, but I was I was like, okay, guys, we need also to do some hikes, we need to go off roads, uh, we need to spend time in the forest, we need to go in the fjords, uh, hike on the mountains to really feel the scale and feel the beauty of this world, and also see how the light will affect the landscapes. Because I knew that this game would be a lot more about a, a natural world. And I wanted also to to put really this kind of emphasis on the nature, on the beauty of nature. Uh, that's why we have this kind of romantic visual direction on the game. Uh, uh, I would say inspiration is coming for sure from the photos you take, uh, from the photos you find on the internet, but it's also from the time you spend there and the inspiration you can take from other people uh, making you know in- amazing you know visual uh, recreation of these uh, landscapes. So, for instance, I had uh, uh, Gaspar. Uh, Friedrich in mind uh, because he's an amazing romantic painter, but it, also because it's the way to bring emotion through the representation of the nature and put the emphasis on the nature. It's not only about being, you know, rational about nature. It's more about like being 
emotional about the beauty of nature. And uh, in this game, uh, as you know, it's uh, not like uh, uh, Origins when we had a lot of buildings, a lot of uh, interesting historical monuments, landmarks. In this, in this game, it's more about nature and people living in this nature. We don't have the same kind of architectural uh, and phases. Just following up on on that for a sec, um, Raf, there's yeah. there's a real historical depth to the Assassin's Creed uh, franchise. How how do you go about incorporating that um, the historical details and, and accuracy? Like, who do you go to for that information? So yes, for for um, the aspect of uh, the 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 historical um, setting and and what makes also this brand different from other brands um, is that we need to pay attention to the authentic recreation of the culture and the fantasy. We, we, we need to move away from all the cliches. So for instance, when we, we bring to life the, the, the pirates, the pirate fantasy with, uh, with Edward Kenway in AC4, we're not taking the, the Walt Disney uh, direction where it's, it's cool, it's fun, um, but the, the visual direction and also the way we, we tell the stories is more for other people and also to, to, to be a bit more grounded in, in their history. But it doesn't mean that we don't have uh, creative freedom because it's still a game. You know, it's, it's, it's a world game. It's an experience. It has to be entertaining. So it's finding the balance between what could be authentic and the details we want to bring to life that could be really connected to, to, to the his- historical setting. And at the same time, make the right creative choice to have an interesting experience. So for instance, when we bring to life Norway, um, there's something that has to be authentic about the, the history of the Vikings. So we worked with, with a few historians. We worked also with uh, Jean-Claude Galvin, who is a researcher, historian, but also he is a very talented watercolor artist and uh, illustrator. So he's really helping us to find solutions to bring to life a credible village, a credible uh, temple, um, to make sure that the scale would make sense, the wood carving would be interesting. Um, we are not taking, you know, a Skyrim direction when we create a, a Norse uh, setting. It's more grounded, but then we will make some creative choice on other things like the scale of the map, the scale of the mountains, uh, the way we'll be sculpting the mountains is not like the real life because we can't recreate the world on on one on one scale. <laughs> it has to be, you know, fitting for the the traveling distance and has to be uh, fun at the same time and interesting. So there's a lot of uh, I would say the visual direction is closer to the the, the, the romantic, uh, you know, Panthers movement because it's inspired by the reality. And then we put the emphasis and things that we find interesting, and we want to make them beautiful. I, I'm guessing it's quite challenging going from big, you know, big architectural structures because they can give a lot of they can shape a scene. You mm-hmm. know, pyramids they shape a composition. Pretty, they're pretty powerful oh, shapes, yeah. and with nature, it's I'm guessing you're right. You have to obviously you can't go one to one because of scale, but I guess mm-hmm. also you have to exaggerate quite a lot just because you have to inject so much personality into these landscapes. Yeah, just so there's re- like it's memorable as a player because if you have just raw nature, raw nature is very noisy. Mm-hmm. Um, like, how did you tackle that visual balance of injecting that kind of put character into the na- into nature? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's a very good question, and actually, uh, that was the the greatest challenge we had uh, as a team. Uh, I think we always underestimate the, the job that is needed to bring to life a full organic world with the man made locations, the villages, um, you know, different cities, and making sure that everything looks credible and integrated in nature. Um, so the way we worked, we worked with the jungle Galvin, you know, from for the maps of village and the map of cities. I even did myself some, you know, top views of village and see how that would be credible to have this location connecting to the woods, the nature, but also have some agriculture connected with some fields and making sense because it's also linked to uh, to the rivers. So when you start, when you make a game world, you start from the blank page and that's what is very different from uh, movies because in movies you have the plate you have you scan the film you have the location that is already there maybe you can add some you know monuments landmarks you can modify the shape of village you can modify the the the, the fences of of of, um, of a tower but in the case of, of a game you, you need to start from the blank page and we start from the erosion of the terrain and the terrain has 
needs to have like a credible erosion, credible sense of scale. Um, you have to be able to travel from point A to point B in max 15 minutes, because if you take three hours to go in a quest from A to B, it's just impossible. So you have to make creative decisions for this, you know, plausible scale, but at the same time playable. And, and yeah, it's a question of scale, but also visual variety you can bring to, to the player and making sure that you can have this kind of mental map of the game as you play and also memorable moments connected to the stories and to the narrative arcs. So that's why we also played with the, the different seasons. We have static seasons in the game in England. Um, from, you know, late summer, I would say, to fall, then early winter. These are static seasons. It could look completely like, a, I would say, like a crazy and not credible to have all these seasons, at, you know, at once in, in England. But as you play, it's totally making sense. And it, it looks cool because you you can really feel the different themes and you can also feel the variety of, of the world. It, it's really acting as, as a men- mental situation, a mental map of the game world. So just on one thing, you mentioned like there's obviously the challenges between film, film and games and there's some mm-hmm. things you can't do. Like um, film, you, you you can go to real life. You, you've got that as a reference. Mm-hmm. And with games, you're making a game. Like the, the audience has to interact with the piece of art you're making. Speaking purely high level artistically, is it ever um a balancing act for yourself as an artist you want to make the most beautiful image you possibly can like that's what we care about as artists i'm an environment artist that's what i care about making the most beautiful composition i possibly can but we are making games so that beautiful composition needs to still work in a gameplay perspective and sometimes there's a bit of push and pull okay i know you want to make this very big sweeping um design element but it it doesn't work for games so we've got to rein in a little bit is that does that ever I guess this might be for your experience, but how does that affect you as an art director? Like, are you, is it something you wrestle with on a daily basis or just for your experience, it is second nature at this point? Uh, I would say it's, uh, it's always a challenge. And, and that's, um, you know, making a game is a democracy. You have, you, you have to find the balance between uh, the narrative, between uh, any, in the franchise we have, we also have the historical aspect and, we have also the creative vision and the artistic direction. So it's always finding this kind of balance. And I would say like, yeah, it's a democracy because we all have to respect the different visions. Um, I have to respect the design, but they also have to respect the ideas from the art. And they know that if the world is beautiful and appealing, people will spend a lot of time exploring and would be happy to explore the world. Um, and also if I'm, creating like I would say like false calls because I'm creating an amazing fantastic tower in the game and it's really appealing and then you arrive there and there's nothing to do it's not good for the game so it's always we need to find the balance and for the historical aspect um, I got some historians pretty frustrated <laughs> working with me because you know they would tell me okay uh, Raf uh, in you know ninth century England there there were absolutely no uh, big you know stone castle and there was no steeple on, on the towers of the churches. And it was like, no, but I have to be able to give a visual hint to the player. I have to to show him what kind of challenge you will have in the game, what kind of gameplay you will have. And also we have to be able to see the silhouettes of the different opportunities we have as we play. So if you have a raiding location, you can, you can raid a monastery. I want I want to see the steeples. I want to see the towers of the church even if it's not from the, the, the ninth century. So this is where we, we need to, you know, to, to cheat a bit in the, the timeline of history and be able to take what is interesting for the player, but it's still credible. It's not like completely crazy and fantastic, but it's, it's, you know, using the different kind of historical periods and, and we need to modify that for the good of the game. And yeah, that's, that's always this balance we need to find also for the visual direction when we want to make sure the, the, the field of change is interesting and very bold. Um, we need to exaggerate things and we need to tone down all the other stuff. Like uh, I want to have a forest with old round trees and magnificent oak trees. They wouldn't look like real, but when you, you know, in the game going through this moment, it will be like really memorable and you will keep that, you know, as, as, as an experience. So yeah, you, you have to make creative decisions a lot. Just to add to that, uh, I think one of the, one of the interesting solutions that I've seen uh, in the artwork so far is that 
uh, you know, the, some of these environments, particularly the monasteries and um, and other sort of buildings, uh, you've you've actually got them in mid construction. So mm-hmm. it it's not like a finished, um, you know, architectural sort of work. It's something that's in progress. So mm-hmm. even though you know, it might not be in the time period, it feels like it. It you know it could have been you know the big beginnings of it being big being built. Uh, so yeah. it has a, that certain realism to it. Yeah, uh, that that's a good point. Actually, uh, uh, we found also solutions to, uh, to 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 bring to life these epic castles in in the game uh, without having you know medieval or you know later seventeenth century <laughs> buildings in a nineteenth century world. So, uh, as you were saying, we were using mixed materials like using the wood, using the stones, and every time we have a very epic um, stone castle for instance it's coming from from the roman age um even if we know that in the ninth century the the roman structures were well, very present in england but also not as big as we have in the game but it's still something we can play with and we we always play with the blurry line with the gray areas to uh to 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 be creative and that's that's not only in the visual side but it's also in the stories you know all the holes we can find in history we can use that for for the the creative process of the game, and I, I think it's always great when we can move back in, in in centuries and not being too close to the present days because we have way more creative freedom. I feel that's speaking about like you know the the pre production stage of um of Valhalla. I'm just on a sort of purely logistical production type of thing. Mm-hmm. Ubisoft are in a unique situation. I don't think there's any studio on the planet who can handle productions where you guys do i mean this production was handled across like five you know four or five ubisoft studios yeah even more. how <laughs> even <laughs> jesus <laughs> it knows what mike is there's no one you could speak to to even give any insight to this because ubisoft are the only studio on the planet i think you have this capability so it's a very unique problem to you to handle because most studios you have your in-house studio and you have a couple of outsourcers and it's a very transactional um relationship mm-hmm. this isn't this is okay we're all one company we're all on one production together how like logistically how does how do you handle this because it's cross continent as well like how does it, how did the game come together what challenges did you face being this type of studio because you're the only one of its kind yeah it's uh yeah it's a pretty huge challenge but uh I feel really lucky because uh, I'm working with some people in the different studios. We have, we, we have contacts and we, we work very well together. So for instance, I'm working with Ubisoft Sofia and there uh, I'm, I have my mate, uh, Eddie Bennon, who, who is also a good friend. So we knew each other. We had some beers together. <laughs> uh, we, we've been working together in Sofia in Montreal. Uh, so you need to know the people, uh, who are working with you, you know, on the other side of the Atlantic or, you know, different studios and you need to do them well. And, and we, we are pretty lucky in this franchise because there's a few people who have been there around like for, for a few years already. And we know well each other and we, we know how we work together. And after that, I, I can't go to micro, but I would say as, as soon as we, you know, we stay a bit more high level and have this point of contacts, I think it's great. Uh, I'm working with Luis in uh, in Barcelona, Ubisoft Barcelona, um, uh, Franco and Dan in, in Ubisoft Singapore. You know, we we have this contact in different studios, and we we have uh, phone calls, um, we we exchange emails, and I think it, I think it's great when uh, when you know well the people, and uh, usually you know artists are good people. <laughs> it's most of the time, most, most of, of the time. time, most of the time. <laughs> so. On the production end, like for you, per- just for you personally, what was the like biggest kind of artistic challenge you faced? Um, is there a particular element that you felt like, not necessarily it was like um, bad, but it was just a challenge. It was a difficult thing to figure out visually, figure out artistically. Was is there anything that stands out to you throughout this production that had that feeling? Uh, for for you mean for AC Valhalla? Yes. Yes, in, in, I would say in the case of um, bringing to life Norway. Uh, I didn't have any doubt that we would have an amazing natural world. Uh, I've been doing some hikes in the Lofoten Islands in uh, uh, 2012 with my wife. Uh, we went there. It was just fantastic, pure, fascinating, magnificent landscapes, amazing light. So I was not very worried for, for the, the natural world. But when, it, when it's coming to, to the actual settlements, um, the, the buildings, the, the villages, 
uh, I didn't know what kind of direction we could take because sometimes you can have a look at a, a very cliche recreation of the Vikings and sometimes it's, it's too much like a documentary. So I think it would be finding the balance between the documentary and something that is really interesting and brings verticality to, to the player. Uh, so for instance, in Norway, uh, we took, uh, we make the creative decision to have uh, the churches and, and these beautiful wooden churches, you will see the safe church in Norway are uh, really not from the ninth century. And we know that, but we wanted to have these beautiful compositions in, in, in the game. And we even, uh, you know, put this church on top of mountains and hills to make sure that we can really see them from a distance. I would say that that was the same for England. Uh, how to make sure that England is beautiful, appealing, uh, interesting. And people sometimes have some cliche about, you know, how they see the countries. And for people who didn't get a chance to go to England, they would think it's mostly rolling hills with sheep. But you know, it's not the case. And Alex, I think you, you know that's really not the case. Uh, if you get the chance to travel, uh, you go to Ravenskar on, on the northern coast, uh, go see the Seven Sisters. Uh, go to the forest of Dean, um, East Mercia, East Anglia. You, you, you do some hikes on the Peak District, and then you realize that it's a beautiful and very varied world, and it's not all raining all the time. You have beautiful uh, lights and feel of change. Uh, I think one of the, the big challenges we had was uh, how to bring an interesting lighting to this world, because we have so many vast openings and so many large vistas that we wanted to make sure that it doesn't feel the same all the time. We want to have this feel of change in the lighting and on a very micro, uh, sorry, on a micro details level, but also on a very macro level. Uh, so we played with the cloud shadows, uh, the feel of change in the time of day, uh, also in the weather. Because as, as you know, when you go on a hike in Scotland or in England, you can see the exact same, same landscape from a two hour span. It will look completely different just because of the lighting and just because of the weather. And that's something we wanted to have in the game as well. So yeah, that was a pretty good uh, challenge we had. It was a technical challenge, but also a visual uh, challenge. It's it's always difficult with... Uh, in, so English like weather being what normally is grey overcast, it has, it's actually quite hard to like... When you when we've yeah. gone out before on hikes and we've like, looked for like photo scans or like photography, and it's like when it's overcast, everything looks... It's just this very flat lighting yeah. across the whole landscape. And it's like, oh, okay, this is a, a flat green hill oh, with yeah. a flat grey mountain. And then, like you said, you go a few hours, you go the next day, and it's like yeah. morning where it's like crisp clear skies yeah. and it's like you got these really bold lines of silhouettes and values are completely different exactly, yeah. and it's like ah yeah weather you 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 could completely ruin my shot sometimes yeah it, it's 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 fantastic because that's what you feel when you are actually taking time in 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 england and you know doing some hikes so you know that if you go to pick this trick for instance you can see this kind of you know um alien you know landscape with all these ferns and very dry hills and yeah, as you were saying, if you it's it's if it's completely overcast and foggy, it's very different from a day when you would have this beautiful sunrise on the hills. So this is what what we wanted to to bring also to the pair this feeling of really being in the same place but with a totally different kind of of uh, of feeling and, and the lighting. So yeah, that was one of the challenges we had. I, I would say like compared to to origins when we have this beautiful blue sky and sometimes we had some sand sound, but it's it was more or less the same kind of visual direction in the lighting. In, in um, Valhalla, we, we wanted really to bring these kind of surprises with the cloud shadows rolling you know, on the hills and creating you know, pops of light in the distance and teasing very high contrast silhouettes in the distance because you see something you know, in the shade against a beautiful bright sky or the opposite. So that, uh, that was uh, something really cool to, to bring to life. Yeah, fog, fog plays a big a big part in it as well like you said um the peak districts are very odd it's the only word i could use to describe it, it's odd like you go over one hill and it's like a valley can build, still have all the fog in it and it gives this it's hauntingly like yeah you're getting murder mystery vibes when you step mm -hmm. over it but then you turn around and look at the valley behind you which is open and it's like oh this looks like a paradise yeah it's like just a, again it's the same lighting it's just the fog you're playing with and it's like oh yeah this conveys a completely different mood exactly yeah. um and then I guess also you've got, you know, we've been in a Viking um, kind of setting in Valhalla is you've got all the torches and fire and the way that interacts with the world. It's 
normally the most, I think that's why them sort of games probably have, some of the most beautiful games have always been from that kind of time period where you could use nature and fire and all these sorts of things with very rural architecture, stone and wood. There's something very, um, I don't know, primal about it that always creates some of the most interesting compositions. Um, and I don't actually know why. I'm just, just thinking about it. I'm, like, I'm not actually sure why that always tends to be the case. Anything like, you know, the God of War series, Valhalla, Ooh. it's like them them feeling games. I don't know, there's a certain level of authenticity to them, I guess. But it's very odd how, how satisfied they could be when you when you nail the lighting, the texture, and like the fog and stuff. It's like it really all comes together. Yeah, and I think it's also because, you know, this um, time period, but even the setting, um, as this kind of very, as we're saying, it it it's also bringing some mystery vibe, you know, in this kind of era and and locations. And I think it's great to 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 show that in the game and through maybe moments. But you don't want to see that all the time because if you you have to play just uh, you know all you know the, the gameplay arcs and you, you spend eight eighty hours or maybe. 120 hours in this world, you don't want to be all the time in this kind of spooky feeling. So it has to come and surprise you. So that's why we also needed to balance these moments where the fog is very present and super mysterious. And, and then you, you, you get this beautiful crystal clear landscape with, you know, rolling hills, sheep, and, and the sun, you know, flickering behind the, the leaves in, in a, a very nice yellow fall color. So it, I think it's, uh, it's also a way of dealing with the, the balance of creating these kind of moments and contrast. I just want to put a full circle to something you mentioned in the very beginning and just speaking of contrast, which is the whole juxtaposition of beautiful landscapes, you know, very organic, natural settings, very scenic, to then the the, the contrast, which is bloody violence. And um, like that, that decision, did, was that like, day one when you went on that trip to um on the scouting trips you saw the beautiful landscapes and thought okay we need to set the you know create this this contrast or is it something that developed over time as an idea like because it feels very deliberate like it feels like a very deliberate decision mm -hmm. where did it come in in the, in the sort of the design process what, what did you really feel like that I would say it's maybe a, a, a balance between uh, personal taste and, and also uh, because we're making an open world game. And as you're making an open world game, as you know, people will be free roaming for hours in, in the game world. And you don't want to be always in this kind of gritty, muddy, uh, swampy, uh, mysterious uh, feeling. It, it would be maybe, maybe different if you, you have a linear game where you can decide, okay, all this narrative arc will be really spooky and gritty and desaturated. Uh, but in an open world game, you want to surprise the player. You, you have this, you know, time of day and feel of change all the time. So that's why we, we really wanted to make sure that every single hour of the time of day, you know, as it's passing would be treated almost like a painting, more like a, like a traditional painting, not like a, like this kind of uniform look for this kind of Viking here, circle recreation. So that, that's also something we wanted to make when we worked on Black Flag. And uh, I remember we even had in the artbook, we have a, a sheet uh, showing all those different thumbnails Martin Deschambeau did for every single hour of the time of day. So they was all painted. And actually, the, the, the lighters would use what uh, Martin Deschambeau did for, like, to recreate the actual time of day. So it's, a, it, it, it's really interesting to see how we can have this very illustrative and you know pencil-like recreation of the time of day and not too realistic i need to get that art book because i have got a collection of assassin's creed art books and i'm missing a couple <laughs> of some of the earlier games <laughs> which one was that because i'm just for me personally as an artist i want to check that out myself yeah it wasn't was the black flag one yeah black the, flag, okay. black flag, yeah so we, we i think we have these thumbnails of the time of day yeah the all the yeah the different hours for for the time of day and actually the lighters use they use the thumbnails as a reference to create the, the fog and the, the even the gradient of the sky so it's really based on the painting i'm trying to imagine as a 3d artist and like taking them thumbnails or like okay <laughs> create a painting look with 3d yeah. it's like oh god that's difficult that's i mean cool. for, for 3d artists though it's something that's quite important it's something i've spoken uh great length about you know you spend your whole pre-production phase as art directors like refining concepts and really nailing moods 
And then mm-hmm. as environment artist and lighting artist, your job is not to go for your own creative vision, it's to take this stuff that you spend months, even years sometimes developing. Like take that and replicate it in 3D, please. Like no, no, not too many tangents. Like we've spent a long time really nailing this. This is what we want. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 kind of for what we we I would say the evolution of the job is from conception to pre pre production to to production is very different. Um, so during conception, I will be sitting with the, the illustrators and I will be myself doing concept art and working with the guys and I will be more acting like a, a lead concept artist. And then we we reach pre production. Then I have more and more my, you know meetings, and I'm spending a lot of time in meetings. Then I have maybe five to ten minutes to see the guys uh, during the day to give feedback on the illustrations and concept art. And most of the time we'll be spending in reviews, meetings with uh, the other directors. And then production and shipping is like I'm playing the game, entering bugs and flagging issues, <laughs> and making sure we we put the baby safely to bed. But you know, it's it's a very different job, and I would say like some people can be really skilled uh, as uh, art director for a concept art team. But when we reach production, it's very different, and this is where you you need to be able to to get into fights with uh, some you know designer sometime and find the balance. And you know, I would I was talking about the democracy, making sure that every single aspect of the game is respected and also uh, is interesting to 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 bring you know to the players. But uh, yeah, yeah, we we do have a lot of different kind of challenge throughout the production. Yeah, that to be honest, though, that uh, it just from like observed, I've I've not very rarely been involved in them discussions. I've what observed their discussions, but they are very like when you find two people who have like okay, I would like I say a designer and, a, and an art director, like lead designer and lead art director. And you see them people they have that discussion of okay, here's what I'm trying to achieve. Okay, cool, I get that, but this is what I'm trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. You're seeing two people like who have very strong, like correct opinions. Both opinions are right. Like that's the mm-hmm. funny thing about it. And have to come to that compromise, which they always do. Like, like I said, it's a democracy, yeah. which is a, t- I think that's going to be a quote we're going to have to throw online somewhere. Like game dev is a democracy. It's probably the most truest thing yeah. I think I've heard for a while, but them discussions, people like really hashing out and bashing their heads together to figure out a solution. Mm-hmm. They're great to watch. Like, you know, it's never, it's never, um, it's never personal or aggressive or anything like that, but they are disagreeing. Oh yeah, it's very curious to watch. Just seeing like them, like ideas countered with ideas, and they have to come to this compromise. Oh yeah, it's it's fascinating to watch. Maybe I just I'm like I like I like a bit of drama, but it's it's <laughs> it's fun. I find it very interesting, not entertaining, but I find it interesting seeing people talk ideas and like disagree and manage to come to a compromise where everybody's happy. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. There, there, there's no easy uh, game to make if you want to have perfection or quality, and we we all are perfectionists. So <laughs> it's always like in, in our fields, it's always like a, a big challenge. But I, I would say like the, the best, like a, the best friend for that, uh, the best ally you would have is to be mature, uh, to be senior enough. If you feel insecure uh, as an artist or as a designer, this is where the fights can be really tough, and you 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 don't get to find proper solutions. So um, I, I feel lucky because I'm working with a team that I really respect and all the people around me are like pretty senior and they feel, you know, they, I would say they, they are secure people. They're not insecure. But uh, when I, when I got some, you know, some, some fights in the past, it, it could be really unfair. I, I could really feel that, oh, they really don't understand what my job is. And, you know, they, they didn't want me to make any creative decision. So this kind of situation happens and I'm not the only one to, you know, I've been through that, but when, when some people would say, okay, but I don't know why you are making this kind of creative decisions about composition. It's like, but man, it's my job. And then people would say, okay, but you can make a beautiful game. Just, you know, textures and lighting is enough. No, 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 man. <laughs> don't tell me what I should do. <laughs> I know. What I'm doing. And you know, some people say, okay, but I don't get why you double the scale of the temples. Like, uh, I have, I can explain you. <laughs> like we have tons of reason first we're playing with a 28 millimeter camera so it's really squeezing the eight so i need to exaggerate to just have a normal feel and then if i want more drama i'm adding more drama that's that's my decision so yeah it's funny sometimes it's gonna be very really funny <laughs> well it's it's interesting as well because it, i think it's um like i said i think that these kind of things tend to come from people who are um like i said either insecure or like this lack of experience because 
these people are in these positions like yourself you're there because you're the best at what you do mm -hmm. and it's like question it at your own peril because it's if I, if I speak to a weapons artist, I am not going to start telling a weapons artist, oh, you're modeling that wrong, or that's yeah. not what you should do. Why didn't? Why are you making a gun like that? The gun should be like this. Yeah. The guy is an expert. He lives and breathes this stuff. I yeah. shouldn't be telling him how to do stuff. Just like a, I wouldn't tell a programmer what to do. Yeah. yeah. Vice versa. It's very, it's one of the things I used to hate in an old studio as that. It was our back. So we had like a really long studio, like, current, like a, a walkway down the middle of all of us. And it was two rows of desks and one row of desks had their back to the wall and the other row had their back to the walkway. Mm -hmm. The artists all had their back to the walkway and everybody who walked past always had an opinion, no matter oh, who. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like, oh, you, why are you doing like that? You should do this. And I'm like, thank you. And it's like, I think it happened. Um, you have to hide the screens. Well, I, we ended up swapping. We ended up having a programmer swap with the artist just because no one comments the lines of code on how you should actually code. So we're like, okay, yeah. hide us. It's so easy to have an opinion on what should be done visually, you know, on, on a piece of art, on a, on a screenshot. So, yeah, that's, you know, one of the not, you know, comfortable aspect of the job we have as artists because everybody has an opinion on, on what should be a good visual and what should be not a, be a good visual. So, yeah, it's very subjective. So that's where we we you know we have to <laughs> to step in as visual director to uh, you know you know to balance things. But uh, yeah, I agree that to say yeah, it's always like yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's super upsetting. But um, it, it doesn't mean like if you if you're an expert in something, it doesn't mean that you you shouldn't be open to uh, questions. You know, you can be open to uh, feedback and questions. It's just the way people do it. Sometimes they would challenge something. But don't you think you know, Raf? Maybe if we see more this kind of you know, visual feedback from the distance, uh, that could be more, more interesting for the experience. Let me show you how it works. And I'm always open to, you know, proposals, but I, I'm not open when, when it's a close discussion, when someone is coming with, I don't get why you do that. And it doesn't add anything, you know, this kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, this is when it's, it's a close discussion and it, it can happen because when you make a game, you have people who are more like scientists and people who are more like uh, technicians and some people will be uh, more poets <laughs> and yeah we have very kind of you know different sensitivities and that's where it's a, it's a challenge to to balance everything together well i guess you've also got a hierarchy of opinions as well like you know as say this like as a production artist um if i get an opinion from a passing program about my piece of art it's mm -hmm. like okay i'll listen and you might have a point yep. but that you know that has a certain weight to it versus for example yeah. yourself walking along and going oh hey this doesn't feel right in scale or color or composition it's like okay which opinion am i really gonna yeah it, it has more weight to it so it's like you're right you listen to everybody like we try to listen to everybody sometimes <laughs> 50 times a day maybe a bit much but it's like you listen to what everyone has to say because everyone has some insight to some part way they're looking at something but it's kind of like weighing it in against, okay, one programmer, my whole art team, you know? Yeah. Is, no, it's, make... it's, it's right. When, when you, you're getting into the noise, it's a, it's a, it's not a good thing. And, uh, you know, when we are, we work in open space, that's also something that's, you know, is, um, is a big challenge because we all have opinions on everything and especially on visual things, because it's not, I'm not going to, 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 uh, to sit in the back of the, the, the script writer and check his text and read through the story and tell him, you know, <laughs> giving him feedback about the dialogue scenes. Uh, but on, on a visual piece, it's very simple to have an opinion. And uh, there's, there's a, I like this kind of joke saying that uh, a, a camel is a horse designed by comedy. Uh, and I think, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that in my life. I love it. Yeah, yeah it's I, I I find it very funny because yeah, it's really rephrased, you know, the problem we have sometimes. When we have too many people giving feedback and making decisions, the the original idea can be really diluted and less interesting. So yeah, that's uh the challenge we have. You're coming out with all the the, the sort of quotes today. It's a, game dev is a democracy. Uh, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Like these are fantastic one liners, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So I think we're, we're about time to wrap up. Um Rafa, yeah. dude, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about Assassin's oh, Creed, about you. Pala, um, and also just on a personal note as well. Congratulations on the release, uh upcoming release. It looks thanks, amazing. Yeah. Um 
And uh, what's the what's the release date for Valhalla? It's uh, November tenth. Yeah, November tenth. Well, yeah, got that pre-order. Get that pre-order in. One one thing I might just add to that. Uh, one of the great things that we we do at Art Station, uh, the Art Blasts. Uh, mm-hmm. So we work with studios to highlight, you know, great releases like Valhalla. Um, so we do have a uh, art blast coming um, on Tuesday for uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, there'll be over 110 uh, featured artists, um, so you can imagine the, the amount of beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah. So, Rav, thank you to you and and to the team for for being a part of that. Um, yeah, we oh, thank you guys. Thank uh, actually thanks a lot because. Uh, uh, it, it's great also to highlight the work of the the, the amazing talented artists we have uh, through the, all the world. So I'm really happy you you giving this ability to all these people to uh, be in the spotlight uh, for all this kind of visual creative process. It's uh, it's super cool. Thank you for your time, dude. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. See you on ArtStation.com, the global hub for creative professionals. You've been listening to the Art Station Podcast. Hit subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And please leave a rating and review for the podcast. We promise we'll read them all. See you next time.